The bandwidth for this episode of the AR-15 podcast is sponsored by the Firearms Radio Network. Firearmsradio.tv Welcome to episode 120 of the AR-15 podcast. I'm your host, J.W. Ramp, and this is the podcast about your favorite black rifle. This show is for you, whether you're building your first AR or you've been building ARs for years. There's something we can all do to take our black rifle to the next level. Just going to do a little intro here um, for our interview that we have. Reed's going to be on here. We're also going to have a local FFL, actually, that has some experience with the topic. Um, so I just want to remind you all before we get going that Brownells helps make this show possible. Uh, they've got a 100% lifetime satisfaction guarantee, and they're there for you anytime you have a problem, like uh, when Reed can't remove those taper pins from his new barrel. Um, so we are highlighting the Brownells Edge program lately. Uh, this is very similar to Amazon Prime, and it offers you free sh standard shipping on all orders. Uh, it gives you discounts on two-day and overnight shipping gives you free return shipping just in case you have a problem or if you want to uh, change out an item. And there's also some special members only discounts and offers um, that they are giving to Edge program members. So it's a program that you sign up for, you pay an annual fee, and you get all sorts of benefits, uh, especially if you're a frequent shopper of Brownells. If you're looking for AR-15 parts, visit ar15podcast.com slash parts, and that'll send you right on over to Brownells. So let's move on to the interview. We've got Reed and Corey from CDS Arms. Uh, now, Corey is an FFL 07 SOT2 in the Pittsburgh area here. Um, I shoot with him all the time, and he is always bringing uh, some awesome toys to the range. Um, Reed, I know, uh, is going to be excited to pick his brain about the whole FFL process. I don't know if we can get into that this time, but... Um, We'll definitely, definitely bring that topic up in the future. Uh, we're actually going to discuss pistol caliber ARs and their application, uh, maybe in, in sort of the SHTF, end of the world si sort of a situation. There's some, some aspects of caliber uh, parity and maybe uh, reduced sound signature. There's some really interesting uh, characteristics of going with a pistol caliber in the AR platform. So there's some specific uh, kind of things that you got to consider if you're going to do a build and uh, definitely a, a ton of options out there. So we're going to discuss that with Corey and uh, see what he thinks. We're back from our break and uh, we'd like to welcome uh, Corey and uh, uh, he is from CDS Arms, a, a good friend and a associate of JW and uh, JW uh, has spoken highly of him so that uh, we don't have to personally bet him while he comes on the show. But Yeah, whenever, whenever we hit the range, Corey's always the one that's pulling machine gun after machine gun out of the back of his truck. Now you see, right. That's the guy to know at the range. Yeah, there's always a crowd when he's setting up like the M2HB or something, laying down the tripod. Everyone's like, are you allowed to shoot that at this range? <laughs> Why else would you go to the range? Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about pistol caliber ARs, uh, a topic that uh, Corey has some, some depth in, but we're, we're going to frame this in terms of what's the relevance of a pistol caliber AR when the uh, goop hits the fan. So uh, let's start off with a, kind of a definition. Um, how do we define this caliber or this category of pistol caliber ARs? Uh, Corey, do you have a kind of a concrete idea in your head about how you would categorize these firearms? I mean, they're pretty similar to your normal AR-15 style rifle, only they're chambered in a subcaliber, uh, like a normal 9 or 40 or 45, something like that nature. And generally, I mean, at least from my experience, most people are going with a shorter barrel. They want something handy, light. Uh, you know, you have some increased uh, capacity in the magazine and some, uh, you know, basically better better ballistics and, and shootability than your, your handgun. So the uh, the forty five caliber um, 
AR chamberings like uh, 458 SOCOM and the 40, what is it, a 45 Bushmaster? 450 Bushmaster, yeah. 450 Bushmaster. Would you consider those pistol caliber ARs, or is that more of a 45 caliber slug in a rifle cartridge? I think that's definitely more of a rifle cartridge there. There's a lot uh, higher pressure, a lot of better ballistics. So we're talking exclusively a pistol caliber you would find in a routinely available pistol inside your gun safe um, in chambered in a uh, in an AR style platform rifle, right? Correct. Yeah, like Corey mentioned, it seems like most guys like to take these the SBR route, um, whether they use a lower that they already have a stamp for, or whether they kind of do the weight for uh, for a new build. But it seems like guys tend to kind of lean towards the shorter barrels. I'm not sure what a common length though is. Oh, what do you tend to see, Corey? Uh, like a five five inch range to like a ten inch range. I mean, because if you look at the data, I mean, having a longer barrel with a pistol cartridge, you generally don't gain much in terms of velocity or ballistics, so it doesn't quite make sense to go to the longer barrel unless you want to stay, you know, without having to pay your, your stamp and you want the cheapest possible route. But, you know, you see more you know, usability on the rifle by going shorter. Generally. Cool. Yeah, it seems like a lot of guys do the whole extended rail and tucking a suppressor underneath it sort of thing. Sure. Um. So how how do pistol caliber ARs differ from regular ARs? Well, you definitely have a dedicated barrel. You have specialty mags for it. Uh, you have to have a different type of mag well to fit those mags, and you also have a different type of uh, you know bolt bolt carrier type of operating system as well. Uh, they're generally going to be a blowback design instead of a you know, directed pigeon with a locking bolt uh, like you have in normal AR. I mean, so you do have some differences there, but you know, otherwise, you know, a lot of your accessories and stuff are going to be the same. You know, basically your internals are what, what differ. Which now, when nice. we were talking about this um, a little while ago, you mentioned that your buffer system actually has to be stronger than it does on a two-two-three. Yeah, certainly. Like a nine mil, for example, it uses a much heavier buffer. It uses like a three or four ounce buffer, where your ARs are like a you know one and a half or two ounce buffer. So you have a lot of extra weight there because it's a blowback system. So that bolt has to stay locked on the on the round in the chamber for, for longer to bleed off that pressure. So it has to have you know, uh, you know, a heavier buffer. Uh, Lone Wolf Distributors uh, gave uh, me a call and sent out an upper chambered in 357 SIG. Uh, we, we've discussed uh, with them the, uh, evaluating the rifle and they gave us a green light to talk about it, but in talking with them about the 40 and the 357 SIG conversion or calibers that they're chambering those uppers in, they brought it to my attention that they were having some deformation of their buffers because they were striking the back of the buffer tube so hard. I mean, sure. and that's a pretty, you know, non-malleable polymer tip there. And to have that kind of deformation uh, kind of indicated to me that there must be some pretty severe forces in the you know completion of that cycle as well, not just keeping that bolt up against the uh, the bolt face, but you know when those rounds are basically a direct blowback, and we don't have the bleed off and expansion of any gas and that DI or you know uh, other considerations in a piston system. I mean, there must be some really intense you know point forces there when those rounds go off. Yeah, certainly. If you think about it like a pistol, you look at pistols, uh, your, most of your pistols, um, you know, biggest blowback caliber is going to be like a 380. Uh, 9mm, you don't see much blowback in a pistol because in order to contain that pressure, you'd have to have like a 2-pound slide, something ridiculous. So that's why the pistols are going to be like a locking block type of uh, recoil system or some other thing that's going to delay that uh, slide from, you know, flying right back. So that's the same, same thing. You have to have some, you know, serious weight. That's why you have a longer stroke on that, that bolt. And you have, you have the spring and the buffer to really help that. But, yeah, I can definitely see it battering that like a hammer over time. Yeah, yeah it just seemed counterintuitive to me at first. So that totally makes sense now why on a DI gun you can really tune how much gas uh, gets used in your operating cycle. But with the blowback, it's just it's all gone back right. and forth every time. So, um, you know, when we talk about a pistol caliber AR, 
in a situation where it might be relevant because of hard times, crisis, uh, Armageddon, apocalypse, the zombie uprising, or you know, pick your own you know horrible end of the world poison. Um, I think that there are some things that lend the um, pistol caliber platform to the consideration, and that you know, uh, you know, kind of out of hand, uh, you know, wave off of the consideration just isn't really relevant. And uh, you know, we kind of had a chance to talk about this, but I, I think that for me, the biggest value is that now instead of having multiple calibers you only have one instead of having to scrounge for two different calibers to keep yourself running you have one and I say that in terms of you know I, I don't think that you should have uh, a rifle and not have a pistol I don't think you should have a pistol and not have a rifle but certainly if I have my you know pistol of choice with me it's a 357 sig and my ARs are all, you know, 556, 300 blackout, 308. Uh, there's no cross compatibility at all. So to me, and it, it's kind of like the old Wild West approach, you know, you have your six gun and, you know, what was it? Uh, I like the long Colt, the 45 Colt. So, you know, a lever action chambered in 45 Colt just seems to me to be a pretty good matchup uh, as a pairing. So, I think that's a great opportunity to lighten your load and eliminate some headaches. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, you can probably carry a lot more nine than you can five, five, six, too. I mean, um, that's how I carry my nine to the ranges, just in bulk in like Tupperware bins. Um, so uh, you can carry more with you, probably. Um, the the whole idea of having parity between your platforms. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for that. I certainly agree. And the big thing for me, I would add to this, is uh, magazine commonality is huge. You play your cards right and you do something that uses Glock Max, for example, that works out great. You know, and even if you think, like, you go away from the AR platform for a second, you've got something like the Chris Vector that uses Glock 21 mags. You can carry the same mags for your carbine uh, or your subgun as you do for your, your duty pistol or, or something like the kel Sub-2000 even that uses Glock mag, Beretta mags, something like that. It's, it's, it's great to have, to have to load one type of mag and have extras for your you know, intended use. Yeah, I've got a buddy who's been looking at that Sub-2000 a lot because it'd just be a great great little gun to throw in the car and if you wanted to throw his, his handgun mags in it, I mean, exactly. that's right there. Exactly. And then you also have 33 rounders. There you go. <laughs> Work, working in both. Um, now, people tend to talk about engagement distances. Um, in our kind of theoretical SHTF situation here, obviously there's different situations that you could uh, come up with in your mind, but the common engagement distances, I mean, they're probably going to be within 50 yards uh, unless you're up in a clock tower somewhere or defending your... Um, end of the world hideaway. Right. So I mean getting a big big strong rifle cartridge maybe you're not going to be stretching it out four or five hundred yards. Um, so running a pistol pistol caliber maybe it still does have enough knockdown power, enough accuracy to put put hits on targets um, within that typical kind of engagement distance. Right. You know I, I think another thing to consider is if you're going to be using a pistol caliber, you know, in a weapon, I think you're going to be better off using it in a rifle platform than you are a pistol platform simply because of the ability to shoulder the weapon, brace the weapon, longer sight radius. I think that there are more points of controllability and manipulation that lend the platform or lend the use of the cartridge to more accurate fire when it's in an AR platform as opposed to a pistol. And, you know, I'm not a slouch with a pistol, but I tell you what, you know, I can do a whole lot better with a rifle every single time. 
Oh, and especially if you're somebody like Corey, who everyone, every gun that you've got is full auto. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, that G18 is a whole lot easier to fire with the stock on it. That certainly is. And that, that was going to be one of the next points was, you know, if you look at it, the submachine gun is kind of a game changer in terms of, uh, you know, think of military uses around the world and police uses. I mean, there was a huge advantage of that after, you know, even dating back to the World War days with, you know, having these short, compact, lighter, handy weapons that were maneuverable that had, uh, you know, good close-in stopping power with, with these, you know, basically, you know, handgun rounds. Right. Um, suppressibility. Yeah, yeah that's I one I threw them on there. Point. I mean, you can you can run a can on your five five six, but you really still want to have those earplugs in. Um, it's it's going to cut the volume down, but those suckers still crack uh, when they're running down range. Subsonic five five six. It's it's really tough to get something that that'll run in your gun. Um, so that I, mean, like I guess that's why blackouts there. Um, and yeah, I mean, at that point, ballistically, you got a 50 gram bullet, and so so a pistol caliber like a 45 that's going to be coming out subsonic to begin with, but still have 200 some odd grains of uh, oomph behind it. I'm thinking might be a little quieter, uh, a little sneakier, um, something that you definitely have a lot of fun with at the range because everybody yeah. can take their ears off. That's a definitely good point. You know, I, I think that this may not necessarily be accurate, so your mileage may vary, but, you know, I'm seeing a lot more pistol powder on the shelves at my local gun stores than I am seeing the really, you know, sought-after rifle powders. And so, you know, I'm just trying to draw a parallel there that, you know, it may be the case that you can find your um, reloads or the components to reload a little easier if it's uh, a pistol caliber. I mean, consider 9mm. There is probably, I don't remember there ever being a shortage of 9mm projectiles, even through the worst of the last four years. I mean, do you guys concur or... Am I just like in, you know, nirvana of reloading? I agree. I'm, I'm not a reloader, but as you know, from what I've seen, I definitely can agree with that. And so, if you're going to be shooting, uh, you know, nine millimeter, you know, 115 grain, 124 grain, if you never run out, hey, that's a pretty darn good thing. Pistol powders being available, you know, if you're just looking at basic run-of-the-mill pistol powder because you're not trying to compete or do something special. I mean, I don't think the nine is a cartridge that is expecting, you know, super premium powder in order for it to function perfectly. So, I mean, I think that's the thing that lends itself to uh, the attractive side of why you'd want to consider it. And you know, JW did point out that when you are reloading, you know, working the brass is a whole lot less complicated than a lot of the pistol calibers. Oh yeah. You really don't see people trimming nine mil too often. Um, you just kind of load it, load it till it doesn't run, and then get some more brass. Now, um, what about ammunition availability? You know, once again, I yeah, I, I mean, I remember the shelves being bare, but I think the pistol stuff was the first stuff to come back. And I, I agree, and I think even now you can go into any anything from a small mom and pop shop, you know, middle of nowhere to to Walmart to to wherever, and everyone's going to have you know handgun rounds. They're not going to have you know three hundred blackout. They're not going to have you know six five, uh, you know, some kind of weird oddball six eight caliber or something like that. But they're, everyone's going to have nine forty five forty, even you know that's stuff like that. It's so common. Yeah, and you know I think that if there was kind of a inventory depletion. It was knee-jerk. I don't know that we typically see that when, uh, I mean, you know, let's say the government is going to be going after the, you know, 5.56 ammunition. I don't know that that makes people go out and buy nine. I mean, it makes them go out and buy, you know, more, you know, 
55 grain and 66 grain and 77 grain, you know, AR ammo, but, you know, I, I don't remember the, the shells being emptied of 9 millimeter and 45 and 40. But, you know, so I'm, I'm just thinking that it, it tends to be in that realm of ordinary enough to not really attract attention. And so if ammunition is going to start getting scarce, I think that's the last to go. Hopefully you're the first to start making it go as opposed to the opposite. But, you know, what do you think, guys? Are there any other things that, that would make the pistol caliber AR a good choice in any of our common apocalyptic um, uh, nightmares? I guess uh, kind of related to what I was saying about the suppressibility is um, like barrier to entry or just sort of like a approachability sort of aspect. Getting a new shooter to fire 5.56 five, is tougher, um, I think, than to hand them a sub gun or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's a lot louder. Um, people are afraid of recoil. The bullet itself, um, the, the loaded round, looks a whole le less threatening when it's a 9mm. Um, so I think there's something to be said for introducing new shooters on a sub-cal gun like this. Um, just It's a little less threatening for the, the new shooter. You know, I think that if you're going to talk about it in terms of worst-case scenario, you need something that really isn't going to be difficult to put in the hands of whoever needs it to be put in their hands um, so that they can be effective with it. And, you know, that's an excellent point, JW. Um, so let's talk about some of the drawbacks. You know, I think the thing that first really occurred to me is that there is no long distance reach. You know, just like we talked about, you know, engagement distances, you know, all of that's well and good, but, you know, they teach us Marines to shoot out to 500 meters for a reason. It's because we can, and we're good. But I'm just saying. What was that photo so, you put up recently, Reed? How long has it been since you uh, signed on with uh, the... It's been 28 years since I could run uh, three miles in 18 minutes, but it was like last week when I shot the you know wings off a gnat at 100 yards. So <laughs> that being a perishable skill, I have not let it perish. All right. Um, but um, but yeah, like you were saying, I might be able to ping steel at a couple hundred yards, but how much how much ass is actually behind that cartridge? Because it's mm -hmm. it's really kind of petering out when you get that far. Right. Certainly. You know, and, and what about diminished punch? I mean, we talk about, you know, uh, foot-pounds of energy. You know, and you'll hear the people tell you how much energy you need to have. you hear people tell you how really, you know, it doesn't matter how much you have as long as uh, what you hit is the right spot with what you have. Um... But, you know, I'm kind of like a big fan of the old uh, Schwarzkopf, you know, shock and awe. You know, if I can, you know, drill an ICBM into you, then you know, why do I want to mess around with artillery? You know, if I can do artillery, why do I want to mess around with a mortar? You know, it's, you know, it, it's all scalable. But, you know, the 308 is a heck of a caliber. And, you know, I don't know that you're ever going to get that kind of punch out of anything coming out of a pistol caliber rifle. But then, when is that overkill? Oh, it's never overkill. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think there's, that's definitely true. You, people debate about different handgun calibers and which one's got more knockdown and um, debating between number of rounds versus diameter of the rounds and Compared to rifle, they're just little minor scuffles between um, people because it there's no comparison there between a pistol cow and a rifle cow. Um, right. But what we're talking about is something that meets all the kind of base criteria of something close in, uh, real maneuverable, and uh, so I, I think that that's definitely a downside that you're not getting kind of the lethality that you would um, out of those big rifle cartridges, but. That's why you get a, 
a rifle cal AR2. Exactly. Well, I think that's when you have your Sherpa carrying it. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, one thing to consider is that in some instances the changes to a rifle when making that selection are essentially permanent. You know, I can take a pistol caliber lower designed to fit Glock magazines. It doesn't matter how many AR uppers I put on it, it's never going to shoot 5.56 because it's never going to feed the round. Um, and you're going to have all sorts of issues because of that. So, in that instance, it's an essentially permanent decision. Um, you know, the bolts can't be interchanged, you know, just like I can use the bolt on my AR and 5.56 to run, you know, all of my, you know, 300 blackout barrels. Of course, I have to change the barrel, but same bolt. Um, so, I mean, I think that's a drawback because you really have a little more latitude in the traditional AR platform with some of these choices. Yeah, I mean, if you had a, a 5.56 AR and you wanted to switch over to Blackout, it's, what, 100, 200 bucks for a barrel? Switch it out and you're good to go. Um, hopping into the sub subcal AR world it gets a little more involved. There's, right. it's, it's not just a barrel. So. Um, and, you know, these are some things, uh, Corey, that you pointed out. You know, some of the conversions are a little finicky, a little unreliable in that there's an element of tuning and break-in for you to get that consistent, reliable function. I mean, is that pretty universal across your experience? Is it, you know, d depending on the manufacturer? Tell, tell me a little bit more about that. I'd say a lot of it depends on the manufacturer and whether you're talking a, a factory gun versus something you're cobbling together. I mean, you definitely have some issues sometimes with, like, your buffer, your buffer spring, things like that, and, you know, a little bit more finicky because you can't really control as much as far as there's no gas system to adjust or anything like that. You're, you're kind of at the mercy of, of, of your buffer system and your, your bolt and stuff like that. Um, there's also a lot of uh, parts, uh, you know, commonality in, uh, I guess you'd call it uh, interchange, so to speak. There's no real... AR-15 is more of a standard. Uh, you can, you know, take company A's uh, bolt carrier group, drop it in there. It usually works, but with the subcaliber stuff, you generally have to buy all one brand or uh, known good things. There's different changes, you know, things like that. Some of the bolts take a notched hammer versus a round hammer and, and, and right. little intricate things like that. And if you're not running the right parts, you definitely can have some issues. Um, you know, some of the 9 mil guns can even break your uh, hammer and trigger pins, uh, usually hammer pins, because they, they have some pretty rough, you know, uh, you know, unlocking basically when they, oh, when they yeah. cycle, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So it, it is a little bit more finicky, but it, it's it's the price you pay. I mean, the the factory guns do work pretty well, and if you do your homework and put together a good good setup, you'll have a you know, reliable gun. Right. Um, you also mentioned that in some of the aftermarket magazines, you know, we're not talking about Glock, but like in the traditional Colt and. Uh, Uzi conversions. Uh, sometimes there's some reliability issues with your magazines. Um, yeah, is, certainly. Is, is, is it, is it, it is strictly the Colt or is it others? Uh, it's it's the Colt style, I would say. And the Colt style are similar to an Uzi mag. Uh, there's a place, a metal form that makes uh, you know aftermarket mags for them, and other places. I mean, you definitely have some quality issues with those. I mean, they're the cheaper mags. It's one of those things. I mean, if you buy the factory Colt mags for you know, 50 bucks a piece, whatever they are, you generally are fine. Um, but, you know, if you, if you take, you know, buy the, the $10 mag, sometimes you have some issues with it. You know, it's just same, same with most everything. You know, if you use Glock factory mags or Smith & Wesson factory mags, usually you're fine, but you go and get some weird uh, made in Korea mags that, uh, you know, some special deal, then, you know, you can have some issues with them for sure. Right. Well, and I guess the last uh, drawback is because we're not dealing with the, uh, the cleaner piston or the uh, more controllable DI, you're basically throwing all of your discharge right into the middle of your chamber when you're cycling your rifle. And so the, the indication is is that they're pretty darn dirty to shoot, right? Yeah, I mean, in my experience, especially running suppressed, the whole inside of your upper, you know, 
the whole uh, chamber, everywhere, e even down inside your lower is just caked in carbon, you know, soot everywhere. You know, definitely requires more cleanup, uh, you know, things like that. But, you know, most of the time you're not going out there for any kind of marathon brain session and putting thousands through it where it's going to cause an actual reliability issue, but it's definitely a little more of a chore to clean. Right. Well, I think that pretty much covers a lot of the big ones. Have you guys uh, kind of anything to add to that? Any drawbacks? No, I don't think we covered it there. All right. Well, you know, I think we kind of touched on it, and it's not really so much a drawback I want to focus on, but I want to try to identify how some of the components are different so that we can understand how non-standard a pistol caliber AR is. So let's talk about cross compatibility issues. Um, I think first and foremost you've got your Magwell magazine compatibility between platforms. Um, in the purpose built lowers you're never going to stick an AR mag in that well. Um, but there's also no single choice among pistol magazines that works in them all, like an AR magazine will work in all ordinarily AR uppers or lowers. So I think that that's a pretty big cross compatibility, compatibility issue, although you know, Corey pointed out to us that in some of the conversion kits, uh, lower receivers are converted from standard traditional 5.56 lowers uh, by insertion of a magwell block. And you said that there are some variances in the way that they're installed, Corey, but fundamentally it's the same purpose to restrict that magwell opening down to whatever magazine shape it is you're going to use, right? Yeah, certainly. And I mean, for example, here I do have a gun here. It's a, this is a 9mm AR that I built. Uh, it's, on, it's on a standard 5.56 lower. Uh, this one you can see a kind of a view there. This is the magwell block inside, the standard magwell that makes the smaller hole that the magazine fits in. So you have this. This one takes the Colt style mags, uh, which are real similar to an Uzi mag, and they install in there in, in the magwell block. Now there are magwell blocks. Some of them install from the bottom. Some install from the top. And depending upon how they're configured, some of them re require removal of your your bolt stop here, uh, while others would not. So the ones that require removal of the bolt stock, this is a little, little bit more of a uh, semi-permanent install because you're not going to take this thing to the range and hit, you know knock out your roll pin, take out your bolt stop every time you want to swap your mag block in and out. This is definitely more of a more of a specialty setup. Now there are some that do install from the top and are held in place essentially by the upper, and those are a little bit you know more modular in terms of swapping stuff back and forth. But it really depends what you want. I mean, generally the ones that are more dedicated seem like they work better. So that that's something, that's something to look into too. Right. Now, you know, certainly when we're talking about the the operation of the, the the rifle with the pistol calibers, we're essentially talking about direct blowback, which is a completely different universe from a DI or a piston gun. And so, you know, being my entire life almost exclusively an AR guy when it comes to rifles, when I got this uh, Lone Wolf. Uh, test bed here, to see a rifle in an AR form that didn't have a gas block, didn't have a gas tube, uh, basically had a, a, you know, an opening in the upper that was plugged, it was kind of a foreign thing, and the knee jerk is, well, they forgot something, but no, I mean, that's it, right? That's how it works in all these pistol caliber lowers, so you're not going to have all of those, and so... I don't know how easy it would be to go back. Uh, you'd have to figure out a way to tap your barrel, that's for sure, if you were going to convert what you had. But, I mean, that just that there's no real way to, to interchange those parts. You're kind of stuck with what you have, aren't you? Yeah, certainly. And then, I mean, one thing, too, I mean, you got to think as well, this blowback's a much simpler system, so you're missing parts, obviously, and you have a, if a fixed ejector. Uh, for example, you know, usually built into the mag block. I mean, there's a lot of different, you know, you know differences of physically in the, in the guns. So you're definitely not going to change back very quickly, put it that way. So, I mean, these are generally dedicated guns, and 
I mean, to me, that, that's, that's a good thing. Hey, the more ARs, the merrier, right? Right. Well, I mean, I think that if we're up to all the guys on the show, it would be, you know, like Caddyshack. We'd show up with a golf bag full of ARs. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got one in here for this purpose, I'm sure. Just give me a sec. That's the plan. And let's be honest. I mean, AR lowers are cheap as they are right now. You know, why not make a dedicated rifle? Yeah, I don't know. You're not putting off... You're not putting out that much more money to have something that is one an extra gun, and two, it's it's just much better to do it that way and not have to worry about converting things back and forth. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, I think that to the degree that we're talking about that very specific point, you know, we're not talking about the choice of a pistol caliber AR when everything's going to you know, you know. Hell in a handbasket. We're talking about somebody that says, "I'm going to prepare. I'm going to plan ahead. I'm going to make a choice because it makes sense for me, for where I am, what my resources are." You know, we're just trying to talk about the pistol caliber AR in terms of something to not dismiss out of hand, but to add it back to your thought process and think of it. So you're right. You know. The prices are relatively cheap right now. Now would be a great time to invest in a conversion kit or to go out and find a manufacturer who's going to build a rifle um, if you're not up to that task and get the platform you know, under your control so that you can really evaluate it for that purpose. Yeah, I certainly agree. I mean, if you look at it, most guys have several ARs as it is, most people have enough parts laying around from previous builds that you know, you're know you halfway you know, halfway there to build a new gun as it is. So, I mean, the only real advantage I see to doing uh, you know, a mag block setup is if you already have a spare lower or something like that that you want to use, then by all means, I mean, that's what I did. This gun here, I already had a post sample lower, a full auto lower, so it was very simple to buy the, the mag well block and, and drop it in and experiment with that. But uh, you know, would I rather have a dedicated Glock mag lower? Yeah, definitely. And that's probably the next project is to do something like that. It's probably better to buy a dedicated lower, it's not that much more expensive, and have something that that is made to function that way. Now, as far as the bolt carrier group and the bolt, I mean, we're talking about a pretty substantial departure um, from what we know in terms of an AR. So, you know, my my first examination of the bolt in the uh, pistol caliber AR that I have, um, basically, you know, you, you get over that shock of, well, no, wait a minute, there's no bolt in here. It's just this bolt carrier that has this, you know, squared off face. What is that all about? So, I mean, once again, between the two platforms, there's no commonality in those parts, right? Oh yeah, definitely not much at all. They're they're dedicated bolt carrier groups, and I mean the one thing I'll notice too. I mean the, notice how heavy that a bolt is in comparison to a five five six, and that thing is Absolutely. really beefy. Uh, it's it's usually uh, you know almost a solid uh, piece of stock, and does have the you know the, the squared off face, and just you know it has your uh, extractor built in, but not a whole lot else. There's there's no gas key or anything like that because there's no no gas system. It's just a a beefy chunk of steel that that uh, you know feed, feeds the ammo and ejects it. It's totally different. Now, as far as the hammers, because my, my, my first thought is that the triggers are pretty much untouched, but sometimes the hammers really have to be modified in order to work in the pistol caliber uppers, right? Right, yeah, depending on how you play your cards and what kind of uh, bolt carrier group you get, uh, you can go with an all standard uh, AR you know, lower parts. That, that's normally fine, but some of the bolt carrier groups are going to have to use like a notched hammer or different things like that, but uh, I've had real good luck with the CMMG uh, bolt carrier groups. They, they seem like they run pretty well, and they they work full auto. Uh, they, they take normal rounded hammers uh, or notched hammers, I believe they'll take both. So that, that's great, but yeah, I, I wouldn't want to back myself into a corner where I have to use some non-standard parts you know, in the lower yeah, for, for that sort of thing. So tell me, would a, a hammer, any of the, the modified hammers, specifically for a pistol caliber um, rifle, would they also work in a standard 5.56 rifle without any modification? Some do not. Um, some okay. some of those notched hammers will not work with 5.56. The bolt carrier group uh, can't, can't cough a hammer because of the way they're cut. 
So, I mean, it sounds to me like these are some really serious compatibility issues that, you know, need to be taken into consideration. Definitely. So, let's kind of talk about um, the terms of the rifles that are out there. A um, handful of the pretty standard manufacturers. So, we've got Colt, and from my understanding, Colt is kind of like the the genesis of the pistol caliber in an AR in terms of bringing it to life and bringing it out to the market. Uh, does do, do either of you have any any different understanding? No, that, that's definitely correct. I think uh, you know even from the early days, Colt had made a nine mil version, uh, you know, an SMG. Uh, I, I know the Department of Energy even used for a while these little weird short, I think like a seven or eight inch barrel uh, nine mil AR. Um, you know, they had ten point three, that's real popular uh, with law enforcement as, as a submachine gun. I mean, they're real, real basic M4 stock, you know, A2 handguards and a, you know, even an A2 flash hider. It's real, real basic. Look, look like a mini M16 or something, you know, M4 and. Uh, they definitely probably were the ones to bring this uh, to the market and make it more popular, for sure. Now, among the rest of our, our companies here, I, I see Olympic Arms and Stag, which just, you know, reaching back into antiquity, I, I think that it's almost like Colt. They've always been there. So while they may not be as, you know, they have as long of the legs as Colt does, you know, both of those companies make pistol caliber rifles, and I think both of them have a lot of good, you know, they've built up a lot of goodwill over the years with their brands, and so I don't, I don't know that you can go wrong with either of those. And I'm, I'm less familiar with Olympic than I am Stag, but you know, I, I still, I don't, I don't hear people just chewing Olympic up these days. Um, I, I would agree. Sorry. You've mentioned that you have a lot of experience with the CMMG products. So, uh, what are your thoughts about the stuff that they've got running through their their doors? I think CMMG is doing pretty good. I think they have a little bit bigger selection of nine mil guns than most places do. Um, you know, now I I believe almost all their guns are still using uh, mag block, and I think they they might be making dedicated lower now, but. Uh, you know, they, they do have a pretty good selection of barrels, and like I said, I've used their bolt carrier groups a lot, and they seem like they hold up pretty well and, you know, work reliably. So I've been pretty and, happy uh, with them. I think Rock River Arms, I've, I've always been really pleased with the products that I've uh, had of theirs. Uh, I don't have any experience with their um, LAR9, but, you know, once again, a pretty solid company, and, and I, I have not heard anything uh, negative. Um, you know, I have, you know, handled the Lone Wolf distributors, lowers, and now that, you know, I've got this in my hands, I've been able to get it out and, uh, you know, put it through its paces a little bit. But ha have you had any experience with those Lone Wolf uh, products, Corey, JW? Uh, I unfortunately have not yet. I'd like to, but have not. Yeah, it seems like they're one of the guys that do those dedicated Glock lowers and everything, so mm -hmm. I think that'd be a great option if you wanted to do a, a dedicated build. You know, and, and I guess that's an interesting progression in the manufacturing thought. And I don't know where the rest of the industry is, but, you know, when you think about it, the penetration in the market that Glock has, you know, why wouldn't you choose Glock magazines to form the basis of how you're going to feed your pistol caliber AR. I, whole, I wholeheartedly agree because I'm a, I'm a big Glock fan myself and the Glock magazines are one of the reasons why I'm a big Glock fan. It's just their magazines are outstanding, they're, they're priced well, and they perform very, very good. So I, I think that's certainly important. Like I said, I, not Glock mag lowers will be one of my next projects for a 9mm type yeah. AR. Well, so... I think that pretty much covers the big guys, the 800-pound gorillas. I'm sure there's, you know, dozens of other companies that are putting products out on the market, and certainly we don't want to offend, but we're going to move on to the conversion component here. And, you know, Corey, I think this really does kind of 
lend itself to your expertise. So um, why don't we just follow your lead uh, through these bullet points and and you know talk to us about the things that come to mind when we talk about conversions. Okay, that sounds great. So I mean, basically with a conversion, I mean you're looking at at the minimum you have a dedicated barrel, you have a dedicated uh, mag block or a dedicated lower, you have that dedicated bolt carrier group. And you have some kind of a, uh, basically, you know, your, your buffer system for it that's going to be different over a traditional AR, like we already discussed. So your conversion has to have at least those minimum parts to, to even function. Uh, magazines as well. I forgot magazines. That, that's important. Got to be able to feed the rifle. But, uh, yeah, so that's what you're looking at there. Now, there's, there's definitely different options, I mean, especially with the mag blocks. You have, like I was telling before, you have the ones that install from the top, ones that install from the bottom. Uh, you know, some are made of plastic, even cheap you know, polymer. Like, I think ProMag even makes a... Like maybe a forty dollar mag block. Uh, most of them, though, you're going to pay you know hundred hundred some bucks for a quality units. Um, you know they have the uh, ejector uh, machined in, and they have a feed ramp and everything like that. So it's a little bit different. Um, you know things for that, or, or you know you're going to pay for a dedicated lower, uh, you know assembly that has the mag well built in. Right. Hey Corey, on the mag block, the mag well blocks, uh, is there a Point where you need to be on these is there, you know, uh, you know, we talk in terms of barrels, in terms of other parts about, you know, what what kind of a minimum acceptable, you know, level of quality or performance you're looking at. You know, you mentioned plastic magwell blocks. I'm 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 not a big plastic kind of guy, um, sure. but are they okay? I mean, are we looking? Do you need to have aluminum? Is there are there other materials being used that you want to seek out before you look at plastic? What are the kind of things that your experience tells you when making a conversion? I'd say it'd be smart to go with aluminum mag block. You know, better better precision in the machining. You know, better tolerances. Uh, you know, probably arguably you know, long longer wear. Uh, you know, things like that. I mean. There are differences. I mean, certain mag blocks aren't, uh, it won't be as beveled where you insert the mag. Uh, you know, I've heard of horror stories of some just having terrible tolerances, like on that, uh, on your ejector, for example. I mean, the that you just have constant, you know, failure to eject just because that, that's machine just a little bit off. You know, that, that case gets stuck in the upper. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of horror stories like that. I mean, your feed ramp has to be, has to be there. It has to you know, be compatible with, with your barrel enough that it's going to push the bullet in properly. And, you know, there's definitely some stuff to look into. That's why I, I kind of recommend probably sticking with a certain brand. I know their parts are pretty, uh, you know, compatible, certainly, over, over picking, you know, the cheapest mag block and the cheapest barrel and, and this and that and trying to toss it together and hoping it works. You definitely run into some issues. I mean, like I said before, with AR-15s, everything's pretty standardized and you can go with company X, Y, and Z and Almost always, your rifle's gonna gonna function, you know. But with, with these types of guns, you know, you definitely don't have that kind of leeway, just because of the components being a little more specialized. There's no no one standard everyone's gonna follow in terms of making their parts, so you need to make sure they work. So we kind of touched on the whole issue of magazines, and the, I think Glock kind of a, is t trending as the the top of the heap there. Um, let's talk about the the bolt carrier groups. You know, is that one of those things where you basically have to decide on where your barrel's coming from and, you know, where your lower components are coming from to figure out which bolt carrier group you're going to use? I, I think most bolt carrier groups are pretty similar. I think everybody pretty much copies the, uh, the Colt style. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, so I think you're pretty good there. Uh, I just, I know there is, there, there's a ramp versus a not ramp. Uh, bolt carrier basically and that, that does influence your your pick of your hammer okay and things like that but like, so that's that's why I have I've used the CMMG on on most of those builds because uh, they are the most compatible from what I've seen with you know mishmash of parts now if you were gonna basically entertain a conversion by just going out and buying an upper you know assuming that we've got the lower taken care of are you going to have any concerns when they're mated? I mean, is there enough variation between the manufacturers of one upper versus another upper in a 9 millimeter that you're going to have to have a different thought process in play when you build your lower? No, I think it'd be fine. I mean, basically, if you had an upper, you would just need your 
your magwell block and in your different buffer and those are both you know arguably drop in pieces with a little bit of knowledge with that stuff and skill i mean it's it depends upon the magwell block and how difficult that is to install yeah. but you know it, it's pretty pretty simple yeah i mean the, the upper if you have the upper you know you know the barrel and the bolt carrier are going to be work together properly as they should and you know it should be pretty simple drop in and as far as your your hammer you're going to be aware if you're going this route uh, where you need to make your hammer choice in terms of what upper you're going to buy, correct? I would certainly think so, yes. Uh, the other thing I'd probably do to make myself feel warm and fuzzy is I'd probably put uh, like those K&S anti-rotation pins for the trigger and hammer just to beef those up. Uh, you know, you'll see a lot less broken pins with those. I mean, the factory Air 15 fill spec pins, you know, can and will break. Hmm. Okay. Um, are there any things uh, when it comes to a conversion that we haven't really kind of touched on here? Not that I can really think of. Okay, basically, well, you got to pick the style mags and, and pick the style of mags you want, and, and you know, pick a compatible block and kind of go from there. It's just kind of a domino effect. Once you make the first choice, the rest of them fall into place. Uh, I certainly think so. Um. So we've got three parts manufacturers listed, and I mean, basically, these are kind of the, the bread and butter. So we've got Palmetto State Armory. We've got Brownells. We're big fans. Um, and we've got CMMG. And, you know, these guys have a lot of breadth and depth when it comes to the, the firearms world. And, and with two of them, very, very much more so in the AR world than in any other. So, is there any need? Would you think to to need to go outside of the these heavyweights here? Is there someone out there who is the go-to guy for you know the the upper end or some you know super tier and pistol caliber ARs that isn't listed or? Is it really just a function of these are kind of like the, you know, big dogs on the block? I think they cover most of the market. I mean, unless you want some specialty uh, lowers that are dedicated magwell blocks, you got stuff like that quarter circle 10 that's making neat block uh, compatible ones. You have uh, going back to uh, uh, other places, uh, like for example, that MGI with their, their swappable uh, right. magwell lowers. And then, uh, I mean, that's Lone Wolf if you want dedicated. Glock. I mean, you know, besides places like that who make their own specialty lower, you won't really see many places that actually sell their, their own branded, you know, bolt carrier groups. Um, I, I know Yankee Hill Machine that they're making barrels and stuff like that. I mean, that, that are that are fine, but uh, I don't really see a whole other places that really are, are selling that stuff. And I mean, Brownells, for example, they have a pretty good selection of, of all those parts, including magwell blocks and barrels and different components. Well, that's awesome. Well, I think we've covered all the the basics, the nuts and bolts of it all. Are there, are there any takeaways here? Well, it seems like it could be an interesting build. Um, not something that you want to go into thinking that, oh, I'll just get another upper for my AR. Um, but it, it's going to be something a little more involved than that. Um, there's some decisions to be made as far as mag compatibility and whether you want to just buy a whole gun or do some sort of conversion with a lower that you already have. Um, but there's, it's it's still just as um, kind of modifiable, just like any other part of the AR world. You can make choices about each component, and you can decide to buy one right off the right off the gun shop wall. Right. Yeah, and that's what I like about the ARs the most in general is how how modular they are. I mean, it's great. You can bring that modularity to the, these subcaliber platforms, and I mean, the pistol caliber AR is another tool for your, your toolbox. And it, it's as JW mentioned earlier in the show, you know, it's great for for newer shooters or plinking at the range. You can bring you know one type of ammo, and you know it's usually cheaper, more available, and you can have yourself a lot of fun with it. Um, and then right. also, it, it's a very valuable tool in terms of you know if uh, SHTF, you know, you never, never know. Something worth having. Absolutely. We well, you know it. I, I, I would tend to agree with you, and I don't know that I can add any more to the discussion. You know, when it comes down to it, I think maybe uh, 
keeping a pistol caliber AR on hand uh, is a uh, worthy thing to strive for. So I think I would definitely encourage anybody I know to go out and get one. Well, hey, we got a couple listeners that um, tune into our show on a regular basis. How could they find out what, what sort of stuff that you, you're up to and, and how you could help them, Corey? And, and why don't you give us a little background on yourself, Corey? Uh, basically, I love all types of guns, especially AR-15s. I'm a Colt certified AR armor and a Glock armor. And I basically, I run a, run a small business here around Pittsburgh called CDS Arms. I do mostly NFA sales, a lot of silencers, a lot of short build rifles, machine guns, short build shotguns, things like that. And I, I do a lot of custom AR builds. I'd say, you know, several hundred a uh, year at least, you know, for local local guys and people around the country looking for different oddball calibers, you know, some some cal- sub-calibers, uh, but mostly normal rifles. But uh, yeah, that's generally what I do. There's a lot, of, a lot of things like that. I, I really love the ARs, and I like customizing them for people. Now, do, do you, you have, have like a, a website? Yeah, a web store, or do you do rentals, anything like that? I don't have a, don't have a web store. I don't really sell much online besides some gun broker stuff here and there, mostly local. Um, but, yeah, I, I do some other stuff, too. I do some uh, rentals for machine guns and a little bit of training on stuff like that, weapons familiarization for some of the full auto stuff. I do a lot of that stuff locally. But uh, that's really it. Most, mostly NFA sales and AR-15 builds are my, my two strongest points. There. And if someone wanted to get in touch with you for some of those uh, purposes, where would they go? Uh, my website, it's uh, cdsarms.com, Charlie Delta Sierra, A-R-M-S dot com. All right. Awesome. Anything else, JW? That's all I got, man. All right, well, then I guess we'll take a break, and then we'll be right back to finish up our show. Stay tuned. All right, great interview. Uh, like I was saying at the top, we will definitely have to have Corey on again to talk about the joys of being a manufacturer of all things uh, stamp-related. Um, he's He's got some interesting capabilities over there as far as being able to make machine guns and uh, SBRs and uh, things like that. Um, so we'll, we'll be talking to him again in the future, I'm sure. Hey, Otis Technology gave Reed a whole bin of cleaning kits to give away. Um, I don't think Reed's snatched any for himself yet um, because we've been so busy giving them out. And this week did our drawing. Uh, We had um, a whole bunch of likes on our Facebook page that we drew from. And this week's winner is Nathan Sanders. So we're going to get in touch with Nathan and give him, I guess, a choice between either a 223 or a 308 cal cleaning kit. And, uh, yeah, we'll send that on his way and and hopefully get some feedback as far as how Otis um, Otis's new cleaning kits are are meeting his needs. I'm sure he's got some rifles sitting around that could use use a nice new cleaning kit. So we're going to be uh, continuing to give away a whole host of Otis tools and cleaning supplies um, either every week or every other week. I'm not quite sure. I know Anthony has the has the plan, uh, but yeah, this week Nathan won. So. Uh, We'll get in touch with them and get that sent out. As far as feedback, I grabbed a couple things here. Um, I'll just go over them briefly on my own. There's a few that I want to run by the rest of the hosts and maybe have a little discussion about, so I'll save save a few for next week when everybody else is on. Um, first here, Dan V, he says, I'd like to search old episodes, but you don't have a search function on your website. Please consider adding one the next time you're tweaking your page. Thanks. Uh, and I've got a note here from Reed that we do have a search function now. So that may have been in direct, uh, as a direct result of Dan's feedback. Um, but yeah, there's a search function there on the right in the sidebar. If you scroll quite a ways down, um, you can search the page. Joel says, I'm not sure if this is the best way to send feedback and a question. Um, that said, thank, thank you for this episode. Well, we got it. So it worked. I'd already discovered 80% arms due to a comment that you'd made and a friend that has nearly completed an 80% AR build. I know you'd mentioned changes to ATF policy, 
from what I understand, I can build an 80% AR, but after I die, this creates issues for my son who would end up with any guns. If this is true, would a gun trust make this easier? Uh, in this circumstance, I think a gun trust makes a whole host of issues like this a lot easier. Um, as far as end of life planning, there's hopefully you're going to have a whole safe of guns uh, to pass on to your loved ones. And a lot of people just don't really know what to do with those. Um, what the legal way of dealing with them is, whether you can just pull them out of the safe and take them home or whether you have to do some sort of transfer, background check. Setting up a gun trust and having your descendants um, or just trusted friends, people that you are close with that you want to pass these items on to, having them be a part of that trust can make um, all those end of life decisions so much easier for your loved ones that are going to be dealing with your affairs and your estate. Um, so going down the gun trust route is really a great option for those sorts of issues. Um, I know Reed is a huge proponent of running questions like that by an actual legit lawyer rather than just kind of filling out a form online, um, maybe like you would for an NFA trust, um, because there's a lot of specific instances like that as far as the end of life issues um, that you could write into it that would make it a whole lot easier um, for your loved ones. So yeah, I think going, going the gun trust route would be a great decision. Ken here says, I recently discovered your podcast and want to listen to all of them. I, that's cool. Thank you. <laughs> I was able to download to episode 90 using iTunes. I was able to download to 64 using the web page. I want to listen to episode 63 all the way back to number one. I really wanted to listen to the range bag segment, and that is where it stopped. How do I get episodes one to 63? Um, he also said, P.S. I subscribed to your YouTube channel and left a five-star review on iTunes. Well, thanks, Ken. Uh, that feedback is really important to us, so thanks for leaving that. Um, I am going to check with Jake and Reed, the guys that have been on the show the entire time, and see how most people like to track down those shows, those older shows. I just did a search on the web page, and um, they're listed. They have like a, a page for each one, but I couldn't seem to find the audio file. So I'm going to run that one by the, the team kind of behind the scenes and see where people are going for those episodes um, because I know there's some really good content and it's great when people uh, take the effort, the, the time to, to go back and review some of those old shows because um, there's a lot of things that, that haven't necessarily gone out of date since then. Uh, like I said, there's a couple more here. Um, that I'm going to go over with the other guys. Bob asked some questions about 458 SOCOM versus 450 Bushmaster. That's something I don't really know much about, so we'll run it by uh, uh, Reed and Anthony. And then DW um, was asking about 65 Grendel. Um, so we'll definitely talk about some of those other calibers there uh, when I get the guys on. Well, that's it. Uh, that's it for this week. Um, if you guys would send us any questions or comments to feedback at ar15podcast.com uh, we love to feature them here on the show and discuss uh, discuss our opinions our ideas give you feedback on your next build um, so just send that feedback right on in you can also send us a recorded voicemail using the speak, speak, speak pipe plugin on the right hand side of the podcast website you can subscribe and listen to us for free in iTunes or over on Stitcher, uh, where you can also leave us reviews like so many of you do on a regular basis. And those reviews uh, help place our show higher and they help people find us um, when they're looking for a show like this. Share your pictures with us uh, over on Instagram at AR15podcast. Uh, tag your pictures with hashtag AR15podcast, AR15podcast. And uh, we'll throw some in the show notes. We'll share some on our Facebook page. And uh, we love seeing your builds and, and what you do with them uh, when you get to take them to the range and do three gun competition, stuff like that. Instagram has been a great way to uh, kind of get, get a view into the life of the listener. Follow us on Google Plus, uh, where you can watch us live. Plus.google.com slash plus AR15 podcast. Check us out over at YouTube and Facebook. Just search for us, AR15 Podcast. 
and I think you'll find us. Remember, we are part of the Firearms Radio Network, so there's a whole host of other shows. I think there's 12 or 15 nowadays um, on all sorts of different topics having to do with things that would interest like-minded uh, firearms enthusiasts, uh, whether it's getting fit uh, so that you can run around and do a three-gun uh, competition, whether it is um, the long-range bent on all of this, really stretching things out and uh, having interviews with great precision shooters and companies. There's a whole bunch of shows out there that uh, I'm sure you'd love to check out. If you visit firearmsradio.tv, uh, you can find your way to those. Remember, like I said at the beginning, there's our Brownells affiliate link at ar15podcast.com slash parts. And if you use our Amazon affiliate links over at firearmsradio.tv or our website, ar 15 podcastcom uh, we get a little uh, kickback on your purchase. doesn't cost you anything extra, and it helps us cover our hosting, um, like our file hosting fees. Uh, we're definitely not pulling in a salary or anything like that, but the podcast does cost money to uh, throw up on the internet, so we, we very much appreciate when you take the, the extra time when you're making a purchase to go through those links and uh, help support the show. With that, I'm going to sign off here. We will see you again next week. And thanks so much for being a dedicated listener. And uh, leave us some feedback. Get in touch. Talk to you later, guys. This has been a production of the Firearms Radio Network. You can find more information at firearmsradio.tv.